All right. The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. Mike says it's working. Let me see. Desktop audio seems to be working. Mike seems to be working. Let's hope it does not cut off in the middle of this. Not a long intro. I'm going to try to pause it as little as possible. Try to maintain focus. Let's hope we don't have any distractions because I have a dude that I think is supposed to be calling me. But I just want to record. So fuck it. I'm going to do it. I, have to, I don't want to have to edit the videos because, dude, just let me take it one take. Last time I edited a video, I used Filmora or like Wondershare Filmora. And then I uploaded the video. My God, I just can't bring myself to delete it. But I really should delete it. Like, there's just this big ass. My hair is a mess. But there's this big ass fucking just watermark and all in the middle of the screen, man. It's horrible. It's fucking distasteful, man. I can't believe that is so cancer. That is like, oh my God, that is so bad, man. These timestamps for you to look back at. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of shit that he goes into here, man. There's a lot of stuff here, man. We're today we're going to be watching the laws of human nature by Robert Greene, a detailed summary from escaping ordinary. I don't know. B B C marks. I have no idea what that really means, but it's a 44 minute video. With me, as always, you know, last time I had an hour long video. I think this might go to an hour. I mean, if everything goes well, but I, like I really I hope, you know, I'm not going to edit a video. So if I have to do something, I mean, I'm in trouble. I don't want to make I don't want to make a bad video for you guys. I really want to make a good video where I could just be here and I can watch this. But I mean, shit, I do be kind of busy sometimes. So, you know, I have shit coming up. I'm not completely. Just on my own here i'm not home alone right now but with that being said two minutes of an intro let's get straight into it the laws of human nature let's go we're going to learn about humans the laws of human nature by robert green we're going to be doing a detailed breakdown of this book and by the end of this video you're going to have a super clear understanding of how you can use the laws of human nature to live a better life and avoid <laughs> toxic relationships <clears throat> We are all social creatures and knowing why people do what they do is one of the most important tools you can have. We're going to go over why parts of our brains affect our decision making, how to detach from your emotions, dealing with narcissists, toxic characteristics of people to avoid, how to look behind the mask that people wear, the dark side within us, and a heap more. Let's jump mm. into it. The shadow or what? Okay, he's got his own little fucking intro. Let's go. Escaping Ordinary. Love it. The watermark, too. This is Jane. Jane is married to Paul. What Paul doesn't know yet is that Jane has actually been engaging in an affair. Oh, hate to see it. John the the co worker John? Here is Mark. Mark likes to give to the poor, but only if he can promote it to his fans on social media <laughs> and gain more followers. <laughs> It's a lot of Mary people like Kate that. like to pretend like they are friends, but behind closed doors, they gossip and try to sabotage each other. Wow. So why do we do what we do? Law one, the law of irrationality. Master <coughs> your emotional self. Here we go, baby. Like law one. yourself in control of your fate. Yes. Consciously planning the course of your life as best you can. But you are largely unaware of how deeply your emotions dominate you. Mm, this is true. I bet We're you very think that you're in complete control of your life. But are you really? You are, for the most part, completely unaware of how deeply oh, your emotions something. control your life. The changes in your mood and this disconnect from reality is where bad decisions and negative thoughts originate. Well, what is reality? Rationality is your ability to counteract these emotional effects on your decision making. Mm. The first we developed step on the it path for a reason. To becoming a rational person is accepting that humans are fundamentally irrational creatures. This is true. Living organisms for millions of years <clears throat> depended on their instincts <clears throat> to survive. Over time, instincts. for some animals, this evolved from an instinct to a feeling of fear. Our brains have evolved to a higher mammalian brain, which is comprised of three parts. The first and oldest being the reptilian part of the brain, which automatically controls and regulates the body. Yes. This part of the brain is where our instincts derive from. Next is the old mammalian brain or the limbic brain. Our feelings and emotions are governed here. And finally, on top of that, we have the neocortex, the part of the brain 
that controls cognition and language. That only we, we really have. rationality resides here between these two parts of the brain. Well, I wouldn't. Say, I can't say that. I can't say that. You know why I shouldn't say that? Because I don't know that to be true. I don't know that we're the only ones with a neocortex. We probably aren't, because I know a lot of brains that don't just look like they stop here. I feel like I do. I do know animals that feel like their brains kind of look like this, kind of like ours, just smaller. So maybe they would have a neocortex. Our emotions originate here in the limbic brain. Chemicals are released to arouse our awareness of our surroundings. The problem is when we try to translate these sensations and feelings into words using our neocortex. Hmm. For these two different parts of the brain, the communication and translation taking place between them is often inaccurate. And of hence course it leads is. to our irrationality. <sighs> Emotions and cognition are not easily translatable. What seems like anger may truly just come from a source of envy. Whereas animals feel fear for a short time, we often dwell on our fears. We make Why? them greater than they are, and we can feel long-term anxiety. Why? We are always feeling certain emotions, and therefore they are always infecting our thinking. Rational people are aware of this. Being able to mitigate your emotions from your thinking helps you make rational decisions. Irrational people are not even aware that their emotions are playing a role in their thinking. Mm. Often making rash decisions or exploding with rage over menial discomforts. Don't worry though, there are ways we can mitigate our inherently <coughs> irrational minds. Step one, recognize and understand your biases. Absolutely. The most this, common emotion is the I've, desire. I've actually to seen this bit. I've actually seen up to this bit a little bit. Kind of skipped like this past bit um, to understand how there's like a miscommunication between the limbic and the neocortex. I didn't, I skipped that, but I got to this bit here and even all these biases here, these are not all the biases. Like there's actually more, believe it or not. The avoidance of pain. This pleasure principle in thinking is the source of all our mental biases. Confirmation bias. Going in search of evidence. What the fuck? Dude, the principle. The most common emotion is the desire for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Well, of course, because pain, it only that's what? That's like you saying a shoe is a shoe. Like, of course. Like the reason for something being pleasurable is that we the the body it, it by itself through natural causes and through natural causation. It makes it feel it releases good chemicals that make you feel good because as an animal, as a system, you're designed to want to have more of that thing because likely it would keep you alive. Likely it may not be directly it might keep you alive, right? But like indirectly, it probably would keep you alive. Something like dopamine doesn't necessarily directly keep you alive, but it's like that uh, uh, chemical that's responsible for you desiring something for you to want to go get it you're like okay i have i have this dopamine chemical and it feels good so now i'm gonna go and chase after it because it feels good and like of course you want to keep doing what feels good because as a person that feels things and i'm consciously aware of what i'm feeling and if i can in any way shape or form dictate or arrange not arrange but if i could like sort of dictate what i feel of course Nobody wants to feel unpleasure. Nobody wants to feel pain. It's not fun. It's not nice. It hurts. Um, so, of course, you want to feel pleasure. And, you know, I mean, as humans who can sort of come up with a plan and we could sort of like really envision and conceptualize and strategize how we are going to sort of try to get more pleasure and more avoidance of pain. It's like, yeah, makes sense. Because, I mean, look, look, of course. I mean, if animals knew how to always, if, if they had as much, if they could strategize as much as we do, and they could like, you know, have all the processes that we do, they'd be just like us, of course, I mean, we're all animals, and they would do the same thing. Like, they would strategize, how can I just, like, even, I, could I ignore certain things just because me ignoring them would ha make me have more pleasure and it could help, help me avoid pain. So therefore, I don't really care that I have this rationality function. I don't really want to use it right now because emotionally, 
I'm being I'm I'm being I'm driving with this emotion thingy and emotion is a desire for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. So here we have the first one, just the confirmation bias. Of course, he's going to talk about it, right? Like if I could give like a quick uh, pre pre like little the, the position right here is like it's like the part where confirmation bias is. Let's say you're going to research. Some, I think this is what it is. Please, I, I help me. God, I'm not wrong. Please. I'm going to sound so stupid. It's going to sound I'm like Dunning-Kruger affecting the fuck out of this right now. But I'm pretty sure it's like when you search, like if I'm giving you an example, it's not it's not just that, but it's like, let me give an example. You are having an argument with a friend. Somebody is you're trying to bring up facts to support your argument and sort of um, annihilate theirs. So you're going to search something up with the pre notion like you're gonna search it up and sort of directly not even fully consciously realizing that you're gonna search this up directly only looking for articles that will likely confirm what you already believe or they will help you back up your argument and they're not against your argument you're not really looking for anything against your argument you're only looking to reinforce what you already believe And that's how I would define confirmation bias, right? And that you're not being, you're not really just caring all about the truth. Like we should have a function that should, that should allow us to understand that we have biases, but no, we don't. So we're not only just seeking truth. A lot of times we're driving with emotion and that is the desire for pleasure. And therefore you're going to have all of these biases, which are going to help you feel the most pleasure. You're not actually just looking for truth and to be right and to be for justice, like no, you're just looking to feel kind of good about yourself or something, you know. It's the source of all our mental. Biases. That is the most I'm ever gonna pause it. No, I need Confirmation to shut up. bias, going in search of evidence to support your point of view, yes, and turning a blind eye to anything that disconfirms your held belief. Oh, finding evidence oh, that confirms oh, oh, what we want. Oh. My mom's calling me. Hello. Oh, see, I no have to go by a sacar. No, no se me olvida. I got it. Oh, okay, okay, bye. Yeah, that's just my mom telling me I gotta take out the trash. He he he. You're gonna have to wait, mom. This is a long video. To I got it though. But confirmation you worry. bias. Counteract this by also playing devil's advocate and finding opposing views. Counteract by playing bias. devil's advocate. How can this idea be wrong if I can have so much? Hey, and look, yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't want to pause it. Look, you don't do that as well because it takes up more cognitive resources to play devil's advocate. It's much just easier to just be like, oh, I don't need to do all that extra work to go and play devil's advocate. Like, do you even really care that much about being right? Like, you're going to go and waste up those cognitive resources to go play devil's advocate for this argument that you probably don't even really feel that passionate about. So you're just going to be like, fuck it. I'm just going to stick with what I believe. Don't really care. Don't really give enough of a fuck. To do anything further you right? to defend it you may even have doubts about the truth of this belief what you to defend it how can this idea using views conviction bias what is this how can this idea be wrong if i can have so much energy to defend it oh you may even have doubts about the truth of this belief but now you have <coughs> dug a hole where you feel the need to defend the idea and convince yourself that it is true tribe mentality appearance bias the halo effect if someone appears to have a positive quality we tend to attribute other positive qualities to that person without any evidence like same can be said negative qualities yeah appearances are misleading wow that is true that is very bias we love and are relieved when we find other people who think the same way that we do isolation and another tribe mentality makes us depressed Groupthink is when people take up ideas solely because they bring us comfort. And, and why does it make you depressed? Because thousands of years ago, if you got kicked from a tribe, if your ancestors, whatever, like I'm talking about a long time ago, if your ancestors got kicked from their tribe, I mean, they were dead. So of course the genetics would have you just being like, you know what, just conform, just work it, just work with the society. We don't really, you don't really need to do all of that individuals like lone wolf stuff. Doesn't really help. Doesn't really help. Nowadays, though, we've we gotten to a point where none of that is also really that necessary, man. Like, stop making me want a girlfriend. 
I don't need to like keep like humanity going. They're gonna keep going without me. I don't need to contribute to the reproduction chain. Okay, I can I can end the bloodline. My brother, I don't. I'm not ending the bloodline. My brother already has a kid. Okay, I have a, a little nephew. Uh, but I can choose not to do anything. But I, it's like, why do I want to, man? These women nowadays in this generation. Ugh. I might have just I might have just exhibited the blame bias. I'm blaming my generation, sort of grouping all of the bad people together and sort of just using that as the main image of this generation, right? Because you're only ever really going to look at the the bad apples and be like, yep, yeah, I'm going to associate this entire generation with just these bad apples. <sighs> man, these people nowadays, man, they all have an avoidant attachment style, man. Why? Why do, like, why does this generation, I feel like I've noticed that this generation, a lot of people have an avoidant attachment style. A lot. So many. And I have the anxious attachment style. You know what that fucking does to me? Like, dating is a fucking emotional roller coaster to me. I am not built for avoiding people. The last person that I was just talking to had an avoid has an avoidant personality, bro. These are the motherfuckers that don't want shit. Like, they don't... For some reason, they still need, like, security and attachment. But they're gonna, like, lie to themselves about it. And they're not really gonna recognize it. They're sort of just gonna suppress, repress, whatever the fuck. I don't know. Like... And those are the motherfuckers that are like the sneaky link motherfuckers. They're the, let me just, let's just have sex. Fuck attachment. Fuck intimacy. I'm going to lose my autonomy and my individuality. Like, mm, it's all a fucking, just take the fucking risk. It's all a leap of faith, man. Just release your ego. Just let go. Just release yourself and give yourself like away. Just do it. Just fucking do it. Stop being a bitch. Just do it. Everything is a fucking leap of faith. I take, I will get up and go to the bathroom. I have a basement under the notion that if I get up and take this step, the floor is not going to fucking like break. The floor is not going to give out from underneath me. And I'm going to be able to walk to that bathroom and take that piss. Everything's a leap of faith, man. I will go to school with the notion that I am not going to die on the way there. Like, God forbid. And I do that every time. And I go to work that way. And I come back home from work that way too. Anybody who drives, you do you do anything, man. Fuck. Let me stop connecting this shit. I'm about to fuck with the fucking shit. Oh, so belonging people. to the group. The blame bias. Our innate response is to blame others. It is more painful to look in the mirror and admit our mistakes. Last time. And I'm not superior. Right? Because I've seen this. So that I gotta mention. Just because I do does not mean I'm superior, but it's like, oh, 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 why not? You're not, you're, you're, you're like avoiding people are the most likely to never have a healthy relationship. That's why I say that. Because it's, it's not that I'm better. It's just that you're the most unlikely, man. Why do all you, like, you only care about sneaky links. Nothing means anything to you because you just think you're going to lose it all. Fuck. Let's just turn into a rant about avoidant lifestyles. Uh, avoidant attachment styles just because the last person I talked to was had an avoidant attachment style and that fucking hurts the shit out of me <laughs> This is the blame bias Superiority bias we all like to think of ourselves as likable ethical and rational Yes, but this can't actually be true because if it were true We would all have world peace and that just isn't the case Step two Beware of inflaming factors. And what's that? Our minds latch onto emotions and we become reactive. Mm. Here are some factors which can inflame your irrationality. <clears throat> Trigger points from early childhood. Mm. Sudden gains or losses like winning the lottery or losing everything that you have. And then on top of that, losing someone that you love in the same month. Mm. Rising pressure. Under stress, the primitive parts of our brains kick into action. Right. This is why you see soldiers and people trying to get into the special forces put under such high stress situations. This is because it brings out their true character. Inflaming individuals. Certain individuals in your life can trigger your irrational thinking in positive and negative ways. The group effect. 
You can get caught up in the collective emotion when surrounded by others. Mass psychosis. You can see this on display at religious and political gatherings. Step three, strategies to bring out the rational self. Okay, do I need to write this down? Fuck. Here are some strategies to become a more rational person. One, understand you are fundamentally irrational and that the emotional being thrives on... Hey, watch this. What? Hey, watch this. I mean, I have a pencil right here, so I might as well. Hold on. I'm gonna fucking lose it, man. Why does the microphone keep doing that? I'm not turning you off. Just stay on. I'm not touching anything. Stop disconnecting the Yeti. It's the one that sounds good. Fuck sakes. Look, let me go back to it. What the fuck? Motherfucker. Son of a bitch. Oh my god, bro. Oh my god. Turn on. It's on. It's on. Save. Please. Please. Thank you. Fuck. How much of that did you miss? Anyway, doesn't matter. Look, we're back. Look, I have fortune favors the prepared. You can't even see that because of this shit, right? I'm going to write this down. It's upside down. Fuck. <laughs> I have a pencil right here. Okay, so we're going to write this down. This is how we can what? How, 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 this is how we can what? Hello? What happened? What happened to the audio? What happened to the audio? Yo, son of a mm, fucking bitch. I'm gonna fucking... Mm, mm, mm. Really irrational. I hate that, that so emotional. Much. So how do you do this? This is how to develop your rational self. Let's write that down. Let's write that down. Right? On, the, on an empty page we can find. Let's write that down. How to develop your rational self, right? Okay, let's write this down somewhere. Boom, right here, right? We're gonna actually write this down, boys. Do this with me. Let's so, actually write it down. Here are some strategies to become a more How rational person. To develop. One, understand you are fundamentally irrational. How to develop rational thinking. It's just what I'm going to write down. That's not what it said. So I'm going to write it down. So one, two, three, four. Accept irrationality. What's number two? Examine reactions. I should have, I, I need to delete this because I needed to space them out a little bit more. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's not enough space in between them. Two right here, let's put two right there, let's put three right there, let's put four over here at the end, four. Um, examine reactions, there we go, we're going to examine reactions. What's number three? Increase reaction time. Increase our reaction time, make sure you guys are writing this down with me. Um, and stop trying to change people, right? Stop trying to change people because why would you want to change them? Change them for what? What's the purpose? Why? Change them to be more like you. Why, why should they do that? Come on now. Why should they do that? And that the emotional being thrives on being ignorant. Yes. It thrives on being ignorant. Two. A lot of people. Examine why you reacted a certain way. To a stimulus in your life. Mm. Three, increase your reaction time. Take a step back and remove yourself from a situation. Cool down the emotions and let the rational perspective of the situation arise. I need to do that Four, more. 
Stop trying to change people. Our interactions with others are a major contributor to our emotional chaos. You judge, you see things that you don't like, you want to change people. You get upset, you get frustrated, but it's a losing game. Accept people for what they are and just try to work with what is presented before you. That is sick. If you want to feel more clarity and calmness in your life, then the first step is to tame your emotions. Tame the emotions. Think. Be more rational. Master the emotional self. Maybe law not tame. Two, the law of narcissism. Ooh, law two. Transform self-love into empathy. Okay. How do we do that? We are all narcissists. Some deeper on the spectrum than others. Of course. But you need to define Humans narcissism. are social animals. And from the moment we are born, mm -hmm. we have a need for attention. Yes. People will do almost anything to get attention. This includes crimes, attempted <laughs> suicides, wow. and hoaxes gone wrong. <laughs> so where You've do you fall those. on the narcissistic spectrum? I actually have not done any of those. If you are anywhere below, let's say, the middle of the spectrum, you fall into the category of deep narcissism. You are self-righteous, reactive, rageful, and seek vengeance. These are the only ways you know how to mask your insecurities. If the conversation isn't centered around you, you may give a distant stare or become impatient until the conversation is again centered around you. <laughs> Why? You display high levels of self-confidence and you use this to gain attention, but it is mainly just to cover up your incomplete sense of self and to fill up an inner emptiness. A mask. For you, the deep narcissist, attention is survival. Why? If you're above the midway level on the spectrum, you are a functional narcissist. Okay. Most of us fall somewhere here on the spectrum. You like attention if someone gives it to you. However, yeah. you are not always seeking attention. Of course. You are able to turn your attention outward, listen to others, and not be continually chasing attention from others. I'd say maybe I'm there, right? A healthy narcissist resides here at the top of the spectrum of self-absorption. At the top of the spectrum <laughs> lies empathy. <laughs> This is the complete absorption in others and not yourself. A healthy narcissist can imagine other people's perspectives. You can build relationships more easily, whereas someone in the deep narcissism range tends to slip deeper over time and mm. is unable to maintain and build strong relationships. Mm, empathy is good then. There are four main ways to build your empathetic skill set. Ah, oh, can't I shouldn't Having write an down empathetic for everything. attitude. Don't assume to already understand people. Each new person you meet is like an undiscovered country with new chemistry for you to explore. Mm. Visceral empathy. It is hard for humans to figure out others' thoughts, but feelings and mood are much easier to read. Pay attention to the body language and tone of voice of others. Analytic empathy. As Abraham Lincoln once said, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. Don't close yourself off from others that rub you up the wrong way, or who you know that you disagree with. The empathetic skill. Becoming more empathetic is a process. In order to understand others better, you need feedback. You can do this by simply asking someone their feelings and thoughts and seeing if you were correct in your assumptions. Okay. Empathy is more than anything a state of mind. A different way of relating. See, I'm just like slow at writing. I would be writing these down, but I don't want to make this video too others. long. It's already going to go over an hour if I finish it right now. Should I make it to two parts? How many laws are there? Law nine? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. How is this the most replayed? What? What? If I could go the full way, I could go the full way. Types of narcissist. The complete control narcissist. Sorry. Empathy is more than anything a state of mind, a different way of relating to others. Yes. Types of narcissists. I try to have a complete empathy. control narcissist. Now more than ever. This type of narcissist in general has more ambition and higher energy levels than of an average deep narcissist, as well as higher levels of insecurities. Control narcissists are hypersensitive to any criticism, but they are good listeners, so you need to be extra careful because they can mimic empathy well. They do not do anything with the intention of connecting with people, but rather to control and manipulate them. The theoretical narcissists are masters of disguise. They Theatrical? can play many different roles. They will do anything to seem moral and altruistic, and they love reveling in their status as the victim. Everything they do is for others to see and gain attention from. The healthy narcissist. 
Healthy narcissists are excellent mood readers and can pick up on body language and tone of voice cues. A healthy narcissist has high levels of optimism and confidence, which they can use to lead a team and boost morale. Mm. I want that to be me, you know. Law three. I want to be able to lead a the team. law of role playing. See through people's masks. We all wear masks to show ourselves off in the best possible light. Outward facing pictures on Facebook and Instagram are quite often not the true reality of how someone's life really is. Luckily, our masks have cracks in them that leak out people's true feelings. These leaks can be noticed through non-verbal cues, certain facial expressions, inflection of the voice or tension in the body. Through body language and tone of voice, which is mostly unconscious, we can better read someone's true feelings beneath the mask. Okay. People are like the moon. They only show you one of their sides. Mm. Arta Schopenhauer. If you want to present yourself in the most optimal way and become a master at reading others, practice these three skills. Observational skills. One. When you are having a conversation with someone, pay close attention to micro expressions. These are split second expressions such as forced smiles, changes in the tone of voice, or body language which gives mixed signals. Two, get to know how someone operates in normal how, situations. How accurate is that though? Like what if somebody's just like really socially awkward? So then they like, what if they panic? What if they start to like, they get anxiety about it? Like they start to like consciously become aware of their body language and like their, their tone of voice so that when they do so, they sort of like change it or, or like they, they get nervous and they might panic and they and like they sort of like it'd be I feel like it'd be sort of maybe like a twitch where like maybe they just because they're consciously thinking about it. It might cause some complications for you to be able to really tell. I don't know if that's a thing, though. I mean, I would think so. Maybe it's not, maybe it's just not that common, but like, I feel like maybe sometimes I've done that where like, I might've seen, I might've seemed off in like a social interaction, maybe because I was like, I started like to like too, I, I became like hyper conscious or like I had like meta awareness, right? And like, I, I became way too aware of what I was doing that I sort of just like stopped because I didn't know what to do. Cause I didn't know like, Oh, what if what I'm doing right now makes me seem weird? What if like, this isn't the right, like type of body language that I should have in this type of situation. And then all these questions pop up in your brain. And then you sort of just like, you shut down and you don't know what the fuck to do. You're just kind of like going to do something and then you're nervous, you know, you start. But then if you do that, they'll be able to tell that, right? Cause then you, then you're nervous. If somebody, somebody can tell when you're nervous, you know, you're going to start playing with your hands. You're going to start doing all types of shit. You know, that people know. So then that would just be, that would just lead to a nervous. It would just make you nervous. That That's what that would do. I'm stupid. It would just show that you're nervous. If you're, like consciously thinking about how you're acting and you're nervous. I was just overthinking it. I'm stupid. I think, I think. Situations or stupid, at their like, baseline. Yeah. That is wrong. Then compare that to how they operate under conditions of stress or excitement. Three people watch, take some time to watch how people behave in situations, take notes and also observe yourself. Take notes to mimic them. Remember the cracks in the mask we spoke about earlier? Those flashes of micro expressions? People can try to prevent these cracks from leaking and showing their true feelings, but that would be futile, as they are for the most part completely unconscious and uncontrollable. In order to see through other people's masks, you need to master the decoding keys. Key one, dislike like cues, pursing of the lips, Sudden squinting of the eyes or the glare, a stiffened neck, feet that turn away from you as you engage in conversation. I've I've squinted my eyes before a lot at this person. I don't know why I did that. Without knowing why I did that. In order I to used to do it a lot. Without knowing why I did it. See Fuck. through other people's masks, you need to master the decoding keys. Shit. Key one. Dislike like cues. Pursing of the lips, sudden squinting of the eyes or the glare, a stiffened neck, feet that turn away from you as you engage in conversation. Tone. 
folding of the arms and excess tension in the body mm. are all clues. If someone gives you a compliment or praises you without their eyes lighting up, this could be a clue of hidden envy. Learn to distinguish between a fake and genuine smile. Wow. Genuine smiles move the eyes, eyebrows, and cheeks upward. Dominance and submission. People who feel dominant tend to talk more in conversations and interrupt regularly. I feel like I do that sometimes. It is fairly easy to meet a couple and notice which one is the dominant one in the relationship. The dominant partner may seem to only half listen to their partner in a group conversation and will make eye contact with others in the group, but not their partner as often. I don't do that. Deception cues. People who are trying to hide something mm. become more chatty and animated. Gestures with the hands and arms can become more exaggerated. If you perceive that someone is trying to deceive you, let them continue to talk as much as they can. And when the time is right, hit them with a pointed question and see what kind of micro expressions your question creates within them. Pointed question? What's a pointed question? Fuck. The art of impression management. In order to perform optimally in social situations, you can do the following. Be aware of your nonverbal cues like body language and tone of voice. Give genuine smiles and use welcoming body language. Make sure you create the Arms right open. first impression. Selectively make yourself absent and create an air of mystery. Mm. Make your behavior less predictable and project saintly qualities like sincerity and honesty. Mm. That mystery thing, I need to do that a little the law more. Of compulsive behavior. Determine the strength of people's character. Our characters are formed in early childhood and by our daily habits. You can measure the strength of someone's character by how well they handle adversity, their ability to work with others, their patience, and their ability to learn. <gasps> I have an ability to learn. Character is destiny. Absolutely. Heraclitus. Heraclitus. The word what character comes from ancient Greek and was used for an engraving instrument. Uh. Our characters are stamped within us. Spirits and gods do not control us. Our character does. Mm. It is impossible to remove your character, but it is possible to lessen or stop negative patterns in your life. This is true. Wait. You need to first understand your. Like, what do you mean by remove? Like, completely take yourself out of the game? That'd be suicide. What do you mean? I think just living you sort of by default have a character because, I mean, people are going to subjectively perceive you right and so like from the buddhist standpoint we're in a play right we're all in a play and we're all actors of the play right? like, we're all actors in this play and we all play a very important role i mean not to get too deep into it but think about the law of thermodynamics matter and energy you know they cannot be created nor destroyed we are all super fundamental here you know i mean if we cease to exist any of us if our matter cease to exist I mean, not that we're dead, not that we died, because, I mean, we would change states and things would keep going. But to realize that what you are is super fundamental to the universe, because if you didn't exist, and I've said this plenty of time before, if you didn't exist, the universe wouldn't be the same. The universe wouldn't be whole anymore. And it, and it wouldn't be the universe anymore. It'd be completely different if you cease to exist. You, I mean, you'd, first of all, you'd break a law of, of physics, right? <laughs> but um, on top of that, we might have to change the name the universe we might have to change a lot of things if you cease to exist because you're just that important you're just that fundamental like you gotta realize your importance not in the way that maybe you traditionally think about it but in like the sense that look you belong you're a part of this universe right and subjectively as you're here in this social structure that you know we have with other human beings you are a character to all of them Right? They, they don't know a lot about your character, but you are a character here. And why would you, to get rid of your character, you'd kind of have to kill yourself. No, like, of course, that shouldn't ever be an option. That shouldn't be ever, that shouldn't, that's never going to be your only option. Um, So don't even consider that. But like, um, because it's just like, why not be, why not play a character in the play, man? There's, what else are you going to do? Not be a character in the play? Like, come on, it's so cool to be a character. It's such a, ch it's a one in a 400 trillion chance to be a character. Own character. It's crazy. And then learn to value character above all else when choosing a partner to work with or an intimate partner. 
Character should be placed above intelligence, beauty, and reputation. Actions repeated over time is the main indicator of someone's character. People with strong character do not give up easily, are persistent, and are open to new ideas. People with weak character, on the other hand, are overwhelmed easily, difficult to rely upon, and not open to learn from others because needing to learn from others would imply criticism or shortcomings. The most significant indicator of people's character yeah. comes through their actions over time. Toxic characters. Fool. You need to first identify and then steer clear of people with these toxic characteristics. Tell us about them. The hyper perfectionist. Someone who may seem dedicated, but is unable to delegate and must control every situation. Mm. In other words, a control freak. <sighs> the relentless rebel. Someone who hates authority and mistrusts anyone in power. <laughs> they cannot accept any criticism and are often childish in their behavior. There's a lot of people in the U.S. The personalizer. Someone who is very sensitive and thoughtful. However, that sensitivity only goes one way, which is inward. They take everything personally. Avoid these people because they will try to make you feel guilty for something you said or did that spurred their sensitivity. Mm. The drama magnet. Someone whose only know. way to get attention is by surrounding themselves with drama and problems. <laughs> they always find a way to become a victim in any given situation. That's funny. The big talker. The big talker. Someone who is always talking a big game, but never actually finishes anything they have started. Ooh, the bark and no bite. They will inevitably just waste your time. The sexualizer. A lot. Someone with an abundance of sexual energy. This usually comes from a dark place and they tend to see every relationship as a possible path to something sexual. Mm. The pampered prince or princess. Someone who is overindulged and given too much attention by their parents at a young age. If they don't get what they want, they can show baby-like behavior the brat! to an extreme This is the spoiled brat of even throwing tantrums. The moralizer. Someone who condemns something but secretly is drawn to that thing. They seem moral, but they have a secret dark side. Oh, so they say like, I'm not like that. Like they'll tell other people, oh, that's weird. No, that's weird. And then you secretly do that thing. The moralizer. Because he wants to seem moral in other people's eyes. Is that what they call him that? Because he's fainting. Like he's pretending to like be very morally conscious. But he doesn't. He's not actually like he's maybe doing things that are morally wrong, but he'll just tell other people like he just pretend to be like everybody else. Be like, yeah, man, that's fucking weird. That's wrong. Blah, blah, blah. And then you do that thing anyway. OK, OK, I get it. Law five, the law of covetousness become an elusive object of desire. We are marked by the continual desire to possess what we do not have. <sighs> The object projected by our fantasies. Yes. It is human nature to desire things we don't have. And once we have finally obtained that desire, we are already distracted and looking for something better. Most often yes. this is referred to as the grass is always greener syndrome. Yes. Soon as you obtain happiness as a cause and effect, quid pro quo. If this happens, then I will be happy type of thing. Or if this doesn't happen, like, you know, whatever. Um, and you know, if it's a cause and effect, well then whenever you get something, you can never fully maintain, like nobody's going to permanently maintain happiness because as soon as you get anywhere, you're going to then raise the bar. You're going to then raise that limit, that minimum thing, which you required back then because you didn't have it right but now that you do have it. Well, now you know, you're a being who is never satisfied, so therefore now you got to desire something else. Because, I mean, of course. I mean, why would you be so content? Why would you just stop trying to get things? Why? I mean, of course you'd be saving yourself a lot of pain. Because to desire something, you have to acknowledge that you don't have it in the first place. So if you felt like you didn't really need anything, which a lot of people, there's lifestyles like this, you know, uh, it's not, not a statusism. I don't think that's how you say that. Or, you know, but like monks, right? Like they live like that in a sense, right? Like Buddhist monks, let's say. 
you know, minimalist. They don't, they feel like they don't need anything. They feel they have everything they need. They're not into material things. They're not into a lot of things. They just say, I'm happy with what I have. I don't need all of this abundance of things, right? To be happy, I don't need it. And if you can do that, God, I'm low-key jealous. But I feel like I'm just too tied in to this lifestyle in the West to the point where if I did that, oh man, I don't think so. I don't think it's possible. I think you need to be introduced to that very early on. And it's going to be hard to completely just change. I feel. I don't think it's impossible, but it's like, think about it. Like, motherfuckers. Like, a lot of people in the West could never. They could never. They depend on that material stuff. Right? Nowadays, people see vulnerability and being forthright as a path to truth and honesty. Letting people know all your likes, dislikes, fears, and loves, and believing that people should just love you and desire you for who you are. In actuality, what people really want is for their fantasies to be stimulated. But if you become too familiar, there is no mystery and no room for imagination. <laughs> People's interest in you will be paper thin. Do not follow the moralism of the times, which urges honesty at the ex- No, 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 no. Do I follow the moralism of the times? So don't be too honest. Expense of desirability. Here are three strategies for stimulating desire. One, know when and how to withdraw. Be a little cold. Don't be needy. And never be too obvious with your opinions, feelings, values, and tastes. You want to allow for others to create their feeling. I need this. Be a little cold. Don't be needy. And never be too obvious with your opinions, feelings, values, and tastes. Mm. You know who this is going to be hard for? My attachment style. Does that mean I'm not going to try? No, I'm not a bitch. But I have the anxious attachment style. And that means that, I mean, obviously, for anybody, you should communicate needs. I don't think anybody needs to ignore that people have needs. I think for a, a, a strong, solid relationship to work, let's say, a partner, right? Like a, a, like a, a romantic relationship, let's say. It's just you and this other person. If it's going to work, you're likely going to want to talk about your needs and then see how you two can work with each other the best way in which both people's needs can be met. Um, of course, I think he says, don't be too needy. I don't think he, needs, he says, be needless, because that's impossible. Um, of course, too needy is understandable. Too anything is understandable. You don't want to be too much of anything, honestly. Um... I wouldn't feel like I'm too needy. Of course, that's going to be my personal bias towards myself, right? I mean, who knows? Maybe if I was looking at myself from a different person's perspective, of course, we tend to judge others a lot and we see their flaws a lot faster than we would see our own. And we judge them a lot quicker than we would judge ourselves. So, of course, to other people, I might seem very needy maybe i personally don't feel so i don't think so right like i'm trying to i even tried playing devil's advocate and i'm not gonna hold you it didn't seem like i was being very needy but still apparently my the last person i was talking I mean, apparently they thought i was being needy so but they had they had the avoidant attachment style so you know you want to allow for others to create their own picture of you in their imagination know when to withdraw Maybe for a day, maybe for a week. Create some sense of mystery around yourself. Mm. Two, create rivalries of desire. <clears throat> what we want almost always reflects what others want. The man who has been single for five years gets into a relationship and all of a sudden has two other women interested in him. Or the child who wants his brother's new toy. Creating the impression that you or your work are desired by others. Wait, attract. what? Y'all go back. That was sick. Know when to withdraw. 
maybe for a day, maybe for a week. I'm not eating. Create shit. some sense of mystery around yourself. Two, create rivalries of desire. What we want almost always reflects what others want. The man who has been single for five years gets into a relationship and all of a sudden has two other women interested in him. <laughs> or the child who wants his brother's new toy. Creating the impression that you or your work are desired by others will attract others. In negotiation tactics, always have another party that is also interested to create a rivalry. Three, use induction. Associate yourself with something slightly illicit, unconventional or defiant. Almost all people desire voyeurism, which is seeing inside the private lives of others. Give others the impression that you are sharing secrets that shouldn't be known and may create some outrage, but a lot of curiosity. How do you do that? The secrets need to be new and exotic. And finally, dangle something in front of people that is just out of their reach. The offer of a fast path to riches or the fountain of youth. Remember that possession does not compel people to act. My God, dude. It's like... This, this is nothing crazy. We all could see this, right? But it's just like when you put it into different words, I go crazy. You're dead. This, this in itself is a, is a, this is a double entendre here. Because this text, this text that is being dangled in front of me, or, or what I was missing most in life, which was clarity on this concept. So this is like a fourth, di four dimensional jaunt right here that we're reading. This is like, this has a bunch of dimensions to it. Like, I, I, I'm so, I'm going crazy over this text because I can connect this to a lot of things. Any advertisement, they're going to dangle in front of you what you are missing most in life. Of course, that's just basic psychology. Like, you should know, of course, people want what they're missing. I don't think you need to necessarily go and study psychology to know that and be like a super psychology whiz. But it's just like to have this written in front of you for some reason. It seems like, wow, I see that. Get fucking girls on Instagram. OnlyFans. Dangle in front of others what they are missing. A bad bitch. With a with the voluptu voluptuous, bro. She's <laughs> crazy body. Like, I mean, I'm talking. <laughs> like, dangle in front of others what they are missing. Some company could be a beautiful woman, right? Instagram models. Porno, right? Look at the ads in pornos. What are you missing in your life? Oh, well, I mean, you don't have a lot of sex. What do you think? Maybe you're maybe you're dangling. Why am I going down the sex route? With this is this because the first thing I thought about your maybe maybe your 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 partner not not your partner your your little Jimmy your little Jimmy maybe isn't getting the job done. What's the first thing up here on top of a porn video when you're watching? What's the first thing that pops up here? Let's be real for a second. Like, we haven't all been on the website before, at least for curiosity reasons. Like, I know motherfuckers, they be in school with that shit. Just, just like, ha ha, we're watching porn in school. Or, like, they're just like, oh, I just went on there just because I was fucking curious. Like, we're curious people. We want to go see what the fuck going on in here. Don't act like you ain't never been in one of them joints, even if it disgusted you. Even if you're one of those pure people. Like, fool, what's up here? Pills to grow your penis. Come on, bro. T tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. The fuck a fan contests on OnlyFans. You're missing sex, of course. Old men that just don't got it anymore. They don't. They don't even look good. They're not even rich. You are just a random Joe Schmo. It's so sad because of course you're gonna desire a bad woman, bro. Of course. It's like it's it's so bad sometimes because you're like. Your brain does not realize your situation. You're still going to desire those things, even if you realize how impossible it is for you. Because, I mean, you, your brain just doesn't give up. It doesn't want to accept that. It doesn't want to accept that I, I'm not capable of fucking Rihanna. Right? You don't want to accept that, but it's true. You're not. And if you did, by God, I mean, you'd shake the world up. You'd, you'd flip the world upside down. If any random Joe Schmo like me was out here fucking Rihanna. Do I even like Rihanna? No. I don't even think she's... I think she's a beautiful woman. She's not exactly my type, though. Like, I'm not, like, in love with... I'm not, like, super infatuated. Like, 
No, I don't think she's that crazy. Same thing for somebody like Ash Cash, who was cra- like, look at the music. P- people desire what other people desire, so they listen to all. The- everybody wants to listen to the same thing everybody else listens to. Everybody wants to wear what everybody else is wearing. Everybody liked Ash Cash. Every dude was on Ash Cash because other people seemed to like Ash Cash. So of course they felt very normal liking Ash Cash because just like, look how many people like her. Like, I mean, this must be for a reason, right? There's less cognitive resources that are needed to back up why you'd find Ash Cash attractive and why you'd follow her on Instagram and then salivate over any single picture that she posted. There's less cognitive resources being taken up there because you can easily back up, hey, I like Ash Cash. I don't even need to explain that much. I don't even need to go into crazy detail. Why? Because look how many mother... I mean, she's the... Cra- she's every, Everybody's talking about her. So, like, of course. I didn't even... Do I think she's absolutely... Drop dead gorgeous? Yes. Do I think she's absolutely beautiful? Yes. But I'm like, I, my motherfuckers was doing a little too much with it. Like, motherfuckers was going way too overboard. Like, I'm not going to hold you. It's not even that crazy. Like, I'm not, I don't know. That's just me, though. Zaya does. Focus your attention on looking inward, finding what you truly desire, and then following those desires. Don't become distracted by what you truly desire. Look inward. That's Focus a very your stoic on looking type thing. inward, finding what you truly Philosophy. desire, and then following those desires. Okay. Don't become distracted by what everyone else is chasing or trying to influence you to follow. Your time in life is limited. Yes. Law six. Tell them again. The law of short sightedness. Ooh, I'm like an eagle. Perspective. I'm like an eagle. I don't care. Humans I'm are most biased. impressed by what they can see and hear now in the present. By overemphasizing the present, we lose perspective over our long-term goals. When you are standing at the base of the mountain, you are unable to have much perspective over the bigger picture. As you go higher up the mountain, you can see more clearly. When you reach the top of the mountain, you have a panoramic view that is much clearer than the one that you had when you were standing at the base of the mountain. Yes, this is true. People who are stuck in the present are the people standing at the base of the mountain. People who are and this, I'm guessing he's going to hit us with the vice versa. Because, I mean, there's people who are stuck in the past. There's people who are stuck in the on the mountain. There's people who are stuck at the top. Like, how are you going to get down? You got to get down. Like, being up here is visualizing. But it's just like, there's motherfuckers who only visualize. There's motherfuckers who only stand at the base. And there's motherfuckers who are only in the past. So they haven't even shown up to the base. They're staying their ass home. They're staying their ass home. They're not even at the site. They're not even on site anymore. They're home. They're doing something else. I don't know what motherfuckers who are so caught up on the past really be doing with themselves. I'm not going to hold you. Are reactive to the present events, are most susceptible to manipulation, and other alluring get-rich-quick schemes. I'm sorry, with what? To manipulation. People who are reactive to the present events are most susceptible to manipulation and other alluring get-rich-quick schemes. <laughs> With an elevated perspective, you will have the patience and clarity to reach almost any objective. Oh, I must have an elevated perspective. I must get that. Instead of reacting to everything that is in front of you, you need to train your far-sighted perspective or your bigger picture. And you can do this by detaching yourself from the heat of the moment, calming down your emotions of fear or excitement, analyzing all the negative consequences of taking that action, Focusing on the long-term goals and asking yourself if taking action is in alignment (laughs) with that vision. Distancing yourself from the present will allow you to gain a wider perspective and look further into the future. You should also avoid prolonged contact with people who are narrow-sighted. These people are like the people standing at the base of the mountain without any long-term perspective and are in a perpetually reactive mode. There are four signs of short-sightedness that you need to be aware of and overcome. Okay, tell me. One, unintended consequences. Life is complex. You are naive to think that A will lead to B, then B will lead to C. Events and other people with their own motivations will come into contact with your plans and your long-term goals. And these things are wholly out of your control. However, by first going through all the possible negative consequences of taking an action, you are at least aware of ways in which your plans could deviate. Think deeply 
go as far as your mind can go in all permutations or chain reactions of decisions. That's a lot of cognitive. Issues. That new TV that you saw on sale seems like a good bargain in the heat of the moment. But what chain reactions will that purchase cause? After all, now you need to get your money's worth, right? So what's that going to mean? One, one hour a day of Netflix and the news, which maybe turns into four hours a day. And, you know, before you know it, over the span of a month, that is approximately 120 hours in front of the TV. Or if you extrapolate that out over a year, that's 1,460 hours. And over the next five years, 7,300 hours of your life. <laughs> the guy got shot. <sighs> was the TV on sale worth 7,300 hours of your life? Jesus. Two, tactical hell. When you find yourself in arguments on all fronts just to protect your ego. Oh my God, don't do that. But you got to take a risk though. You got to be willing to take risk though. It's just like, look, forgive yourself if you can't always do this. I say yes, try. Absolutely. You got to be aware. But like, I mean, you got to take risks anyway. You should take risks. I think this isn't even really that worth it. Like Netflix, I mean, are you really? That's like, see, that one is just like, man, that one to me is easy. I don't know. But let's let's change this to not trying to make a pattern here, but let's change this to sex, right? Let's say, <laughs> let's say you're about to have sex with a girl. Imagine that. Like, okay, of course you're going to take preemptive measures. But like, think about it. What if the condom like rips? Like, what if? something happens you don't know by accident and then you end up having a fucking kid and then you have to take care of it for the rest of your life for 18 years everybody has taken that risk but that could be an unintended consequence and you're not gonna sit there and waste that many cognitive resources thinking about is it even worth it to have sex with this person i mean you're gonna take the preemptive measures which should in all likelihood make it practically impossible that you're gonna have a kid right Motherfuckers don't do that. Motherfuckers go in raw. Motherfuckers go in raw and then they use the pullout method alone. Some motherfuckers don't even be using plan B. Some motherfuckers aren't on both birth control. Motherfuckers aren't using condoms. They just use the pullout method. And I mean, it works to some degree. To some. It ain't a percentage that I would personally be taking, though. Like, you have fun with that. You know, because that'd be a hell of an unintended consequence. I'll tell you, a lot of motherfuckers are living with that unintended consequence right now, bro. So that's a very important one. That's a very important one. Or win the argument. You've been arguments on all fronts just to protect your ego. Tactical hell. When you find yourself in arguments on all fronts just to protect your ego or win the argument, you have probably lost sight of your long-term goals and vision. Now would be the time to ask yourself, what are my real values and priorities? Then focus your time and energy away from useless arguments and towards your long-term goals. Does winning the argument or protecting your ego help you to achieve those goals? Most probably not. Mm. Three, ticker tape fever. Nowadays, we all have become addicted to the continuous news cycles and pings and dings of social media. If you are reacting to and following all of these updates to guide your decisions, then you have the fever and you need to refocus your energy towards your long-term vision. Focusing more on your long-term outcomes needs patience, but it will reward you with calmness and clarity. Mm. Four, lost in trivia. It is easy to drown in a sea of information nowadays, especially when you are actively trying to have all the details. To prevent this feeling of information overload and the perpetual chasing of every minuscule detail, remind yourself that you don't have to have all the details. With a solid vision and long-term goals, you can weed out the essentials from the non-essentials, and it is wise to delegate and let subordinates do the rest of the information gathering for you. You can yes. steer the ship, but you don't also need to be below <laughs> the decks manning the oars. Become a far-sighted human. Detach from the now, calm your emotions in the present, and get yourself to a higher point on the mountain to widen your perspective and see all the future consequences of the decisions that you make now. Law 7. 
the law of defensiveness. A lot of people show that. Soften people's resistance by confirming their self-opinion. Everybody wants to believe that they are independent and in control. Everybody wants to That's... believe that they are independent and in control of their own lives. Yes. People all have certain self-opinions and perceptions about who they are, and they are willing to fight to defend those opinions. Of course. There are three universal qualities to people's self-opinions. One, I am autonomous, acting of my own free will. Okay. Even if we have been manipulated or Depends succumbed to peer pressure, well. we don't want to tell ourselves that outside influences guided our decision making. If we feel like we are being coerced, we tend to rebel. Two, I am intelligent in my own way. No one feels comfortable with the idea that they may be gullible or have subpar intelligence. Three, I am basically good and decent. We all have the tendency to believe we are good people supporting the right causes. By understanding the three universal self-opinions above, you are in a better position to influence them. Okay. Never put someone in a situation that would trigger one of their self-opinions. You can use these five strategies to persuade people effectively and avoid triggering their defensiveness of the three universal self-opinions. What can I do? One, transform yourself into a deep listener. Our attention is often scattered. And the reason for this is that people are more interested in their own thoughts and feelings than the person they are communicating with. Yes. The usual advice of talking less and uh -huh. listening more is often redundant unless there is some kind of motivation to actually listen. Treat each person you interact with as an uncharted country that is abundant with hidden surprises. Yes. Find what interests them. Look for clues in their facial expressions, like when their eyes light up, and probe deeper. The more they talk, the more you can discover their desires and insecurities. Two, infect people with the proper mood. People are very vulnerable to the moods of others. If you are relaxed and warm-hearted, they will feel comfortable. Sense this and mirror your good mood. Gentle taps on the arms can build rapport, but avoid too much eye contact because this can be taken as a sexual connotation. Three, confirm their self-opinion using the three universal self-opinions. -opin For them? independence, appeal to the sense of autonomy. If you need to get their help, don't let them feel like they are being manipulated. Instead, Position the favor in a way that makes the favor feel like it was their idea or choice. Ah! Fuck, how do I do that? Yeah, it's possible. Okay. So instead of saying... it's Oh, he said in their favor? That's easy. Makes the favor feel like it was their idea or choice all along. Like it was their idea or choice? Hey, I need you to come help me... Move this thing in my backyard. So you shouldn't say, hey, you should come help me with this. You should say, hey, you've been meaning to, maybe you're bored and you want to come do something. Right? You're not really doing anything today. Maybe you've been meaning to. I wanted to say work out. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, you've been meaning to hang out with me a little more and you're bored. Hey, we can do so. Whilst you come through and help me out with this thing, right? So it's like you could knock two birds in one stone. It seems appealing to them. And then it'll feel like it's their idea to actually go there if you can make it seem appealing to them. I think that's maybe how you do that. Something like that. For intelligence, concede that their opinion on the matter is better than yours. This will make them feel slightly superior. Lower their guards and put them in a position where they are more willing to accept your opinions later. Mm. For their self-belief of decency and goodness, link your need to a greater cause and remind them of good deeds that they have done in the past. Four, ally their insecurity. Oh, fuck. I, need, I feel like I need to write that down. The three self-identities? Three self-identities? Is that what it is? Three self identity identity <laughs> um so what is it free will 
intelligence and finally good person those are the three self identities once you have identified someone's insecurities be careful not to trigger them and then go about giving compliments and flattering them about those qualities securities in the past wait let's see what he has to say or here a lie their insecurities a lie? once you have identified someone's insecurities <coughs> be careful not to trigger them and then go about giving compliments and flattering them about those qualities fuck five use people's resistance and stubbornness wait no no don't skip what does that mean what does that mean a lie fuck become friends with their like so he's saying you shouldn't say good things about their insecurities or what? Oh man, I don't know. Cause he didn't, he, I kind of couldn't tell if there was a comma in what he was saying. So about people's five, use people's resistance and stubbornness. How do I do that? So about people's emotions, language, and stubbornness in a constructive way. Use the language back at them because it is very hard for people to not follow the words that they have used themselves. Stubbornness stems from uncertainty and fear of change. If they have a rebellious nature, reverse psychology can be used to push them in a direction you want them to go. The royal road to influence is to put the focus on others. Let them do the talking. Let them be the stars of the show. Mm, this is true. The flexible mind. Just as the body tightens with age, however, so does the mind. When we are children, our minds are very flexible and they learn at a rate much faster than as adults. The ultimate frame of mind is one that is flexible like a child's and has the reasoning power of an adult. As we age, we become closed off to new ideas. Try to imagine your ideas and opinions like toy building blocks. You can play with them, experiment with them, throw some out, keep some or get new ones. Don't become too attached and rigid to your ideas. Remain playful and flexible in your spirit. Finally, become more self-aware that you are not as good as your self-opinion makes you believe you are. This is true. You do buy services or products to due do. to advertising influences. You do conform to ideas because of the groups that you belong to. And you are susceptible to being manipulated. Distance yourself from your self-opinion to see how it affects your thinking. Law 8, the law of self-sabotage. Change your circumstances by changing your attitude. Damn! You must not only be aware of the role of your attitude, but also believe in its supreme power to alter your circumstances. The way attitude that you look at and interpret the world around you is what creates your attitude. If you see the negative in all situations and you are fearful, you will inadvertently create those situations that you fear the most. Mm. If you are afraid of failure, you won't try new things, which results ultimately in a failure to succeed in anything. That's true. There are two general categories of attitude, negative and narrow or positive and expansive. Negative and narrow minded people are generally fearful. And in order to try and have control, they limit what they see and experience. Someone with a positive and expansive attitude, on the other hand, wants to try new things and is open to new ideas. If you want to change your circumstances in life, expansive. you first need to change Try your to attitude. Mean. Here are five constricted or negative attitudes that you need to conquer. Hostile attitude. The world is a hostile place. So in order to try and defend themselves, people with a hostile attitude seek to become hostile themselves. In their mind, the world is against them. They blame others and tend to make others around them aggressive or defensive. Be aware of this type of attitude and manage your own hostility by telling yourself when you first meet someone, I like this person or this person is intelligent. If you notice less hostility in the world and in others, when you begin doing that, then you may notice that the source of the hostility was actually manifesting from within yourself. Anxious attitude. Someone with an anxious attitude ultimately fears losing control of the situation. They like to micromanage and control others. 
You can deal with your own anxiety by channeling this negative energy into your work and trying to become less of a perfectionist and control freak. If you are dealing with someone with this type of attitude, don't let their attitude infect you. Be calm and become a soothing influence on them. Avoidant attitude. Someone with doubts it's about their the intelligence or competence and who generally see the world through the lens of their insecurities. This is not the same thing as attachment styles. This is crazy. This is exactly what I talked about. I said I had an anxious attachment style, which in, you know, I have a, more of a capacity for intimacy than others. And I notice changes very quickly. Sometimes you may even jump the gun because you're just so adept at noticing slight little changes. And then you're going to try. And then when you do, you're going to try your best to see if you're right. You're going to try your best to ask questions and be like, hey, are you doing this because of this? Is everything all right? What are you doing? You know, what does this mean? Help me out here. I want to I want to be safe and calm. I want security. I want this and that, you know, whatever. And then avoidant attitudes should not be this as well the same thing as the attachment style. But still the same words are used because it kind of deals with, um, I guess, sort of a general niche um, of, you know, obviously an avoidant attachment style is you're just kind of sort of avoiding intimacy. But anxious, you definitely, well, let's see, like, yeah, I mean, it's just attachment styles and attitude are not the same thing. But I guess they're sort of similar in a sense. I guess. That's crazy. That's crazy. I don't have an anxious attitude, actually. I wouldn't say so. Would I say I have an anxious attitude? No, I think that's just more of my attachment style to a person that I love. I wouldn't say it's my attitude, though. I don't think, I mean, nobody says that those two have to be, like, hand in hand. Be calm and become a soothing influence on them. Avoidant attitude. Someone with doubts about their intelligence or competence and who generally see the world through the lens of their insecurities have this type of attitude. I've had this They before. avoid responsibility or challenges because they may call into action their self-esteem. Be cautious to form partnerships with someone like this. And if you feel that you may have some of this attitude yourself, you can diminish this fear by motivating yourself to take on small projects and make sure that you take them all the way to completion. Mm. Depressive attitude. This attitude carries a feeling of unworthiness and being unloved. A person with this type of attitude tends to betray, criticize, and wound others to feed their own depression. Any signs of success or progress are self-sabotage before they can even fully be accomplished. People are attracted to someone with this kind of attitude because they want to help them. However, this usually results in them also being criticized and then discarded. Never try to cheer someone up with this type of attitude by showering them with the wonders of life. Instead, subtly steer them towards positive experiences. We all have depressive moments in our lives. When you find yourself in a depressed state, it is best to channel that energy into your work or the arts. You can pick up a guitar, paint a picture or something like this. Resentful attitude. They feel wronged and see oppressors everywhere around them. People who have more than them are a sign of injustice and any sign of criticism or disrespect towards them is taken very seriously. They do not explode in anger. However, they prefer to stew on their emotions. People with this attitude hold on to grudges and if given any power, use it to express their resentment in often vengeful and vicious ways. Avoid people with this attitude if at all possible. If you harbor resentful tendencies yourself, learn to let go of grudges. It is better to explode with rage in the moment than to stew on negative emotions that you may have just made up in your head. The expansive positive attitude. Be an idea explorer. Leave certainty behind and play with new ideas. Enjoy challenging yourself with new ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. Adversity and pain are most often out of your control, but you can learn how to control your response and emotions yeah. to any situation. Yeah. Say. Don't accept and place limits on yourself as you grow older. If you believe that you can't do something, you will create a self-fulfilling cycle. 
Your attitude plays a huge role on your health. Falling in love or getting excited about your job gives you more energy and allows you to recover from illnesses faster. Being depressed or stressed, on the other hand, does the reverse. Don't take things that others say or do towards you personally. They are just protecting their own negative feelings. That's true. Law 9. The Law of Repression. Confront your dark side. More often than not, people are not who they seem to be. We all have a dark side. The selfish, aggressive impulses within us that we hide from the public view to fit in and feel respected and liked by the group. Carl Jung, the famous psychologist, refers to this the as shadow. the shadow. The shadow lives within our unconscious mind, but can leak out through our emotions in times of insecurity or stress. Our dark side also tends to reveal itself more as we get older. Here are some wow. notable signs of the dark side. Contradictory behavior. <laughs> A person who preaches the rules, but then breaks them. Emotional outbursts person who loses self-control easily. Vehement denial. For example, a person who argues against homosexuality but secretly desires it. <laughs> Over-idealization. A person who uses a good cause to act in a bad manner. Accidental. The, mo the BLM motherfuckers who bought a mansion without money. Those fuckers. Uses a good cause to act in a bad manner. Accidental behavior. A person who gets drunk and reveals their true emotions. Projection. A person who accuses someone else of desiring sex, money, or power, when in fact that is what they secretly desire themselves. In order to conceal the shadow, we develop emphatic traits. These traits tend to cover up the opposite trait that we want hidden from the public view. Here are the seven most common emphatic traits. The tough guy shows an intimidating side to cover up the soft and vulnerable side they are so afraid of. The saint exudes purity and goodness, but once given a taste of power, quickly abuses that power. The fanatic impresses people with their drive and dedication, but fail to deliver on what they promise. The passive-aggressive charmer will be overly nice on initial interactions, but gossips behind the backs of others. Oof. The rigid rationalist fears irrationality. They use their intellect to bully others that they deem to have primitive or low-level thinking. I've done that before. The snob is so afraid of mediocrity. Not anymore, though. I have done that. Not anymore. That they exert superiority. So afraid of mediocrity that they exert superiority. The extreme entrepreneur pays exceptional attention to detail and seems to value independence. Their inability to listen and delegate work to others end up becoming their downfall. They secretly want others to take care of them. <clears throat> when you become conscious of the shadow and bring it out into the light, it loses its power. You can then control, channel, and integrate it into your life. <coughs> By doing so, your more attractive, authentic, and creative side will come back to life. You can follow these steps to become an integrated human. What are the steps? See the shadow. Identify and monitor what things make you touchy and insecure. What is causing your shadow to show and what are you trying to hide? Embrace the shadow. Don't repress or ignore your shadow. It is part of your personality. Explore the shadow. Explore your dark impulses and animalistic nature. If your shadow surfaces in dream states or dark thoughts, don't try to ignore it. Play with the ideas and channel that energy into your work. Show the shadow. Use the shadow as your ally if people get in your way. Respect your own opinions more and others less. Be more assertive and compromise less. Care less about what people think of you. And finally, don't be afraid to use the shadow at times to offend and even hurt people 
that have bad intentions or unjustly criticize you. Show your shadow proudly. The more you repress the shadow, the darker and uglier it becomes. Thank you for making it one. to the end of the video. Let me know in the comments below which law you found the most helpful. And if you guys don't want to miss out on more videos like this one in the future, please hit the like and subscribe button because it really helps out. That was sick. Building empathy, reading people. If you want to present yourself in the yes. mouth, changes in like notice the of stress shed. or excitement. Best tension in the see their dislikes and cues, dominance, deception cues. There's a lot of cues. Um, the biases, building the empathy, which is being less of a narcissist, um, becoming more desirable. Or stimulating desire. This is no one how to withdraw, create a rivalry. So you, you make it seem like more people want this thing, maybe what you're offering, or you yourself, you say to your girl, Hey, look, I got a lot of shorties talking to me and I didn't do that. I did the opposite of that. I said, <laughs> I'm a dumbass. I'm so stupid for that. I shouldn't say that out loud because that is embarrassing that I did that. And I, now looking back at it, I'm just like, why the fuck would I do that? I have no idea why I would do that. I couldn't back. I can't I can't back up that decision that I made that I told her. I, nobody's really in my DMs. I don't even get shorties like that. I get no hoes. That's I didn't word it like that, but that's basically what I was saying. Um. Why did I do that? I should have said there's hella shorties in my DMs. That would create a rivalry of desire. No one went to withdraw, be mysterious, be spontaneous. This is just basic stuff. I don't even have to go and watch the, the seduction video, which I'm pretty sure he actually might have made one. Um, No, he didn't do one. But I mean, obviously, you know, Robert Green, he understands the art of seduction, right? I'm sure that's going to be mentioned in there is being mysterious, right? You don't want motherfuckers to know everything about you because then you become boring, man. It's basic psychology. Fuck. I should have just been more mysterious. Oh, uh, but still, I mean, our attachment styles are just kind of polar opposites, so it really wouldn't work. Um, I mean, I'm somebody who's willing to try. It's just like, I don't think other motherfuckers are. I'm not going to hold you. I don't think so. But hey, you got to realize people, you got to see people as I saw this very good Instagram post. I'm not going to go over an hour and 30, but I saw this really good Instagram post, which said that, you know, you got to see people as the sunset. You got to see people as the sky, a sunset or a nice, beautiful ocean, right? You can't say, you're not going to say, hey, turn the orange down a little bit. Turn the hue down. Uh, give me a little bit more green. Give me a little bit more blue. Give me a little bit more yellow. You're not going to say any of that to a beautiful son. You, you can't say that. Like, you're not going to say that. You're just going to simply experience it. And you're going to see it. And you're going to take it all in. And you're going to love it. Right? You're going to be absolutely astounded by the beauty of the sunset. And you should see people in that same way. You should say, I like this person. When you see them. You should say, I'm going to give this person value. That's how you can get yourself to go out to this person and talk to them. And when you have that good intention then a lot can get done with this first interaction. If you say, look, I'm going to go up to this person. I'm going to give them value. I'm going to look them in the eye. I am going to, I can ask about the past, the present, the future. I can ask about our environment and the past, present, and future of our environment. I can go up to them and say, hey, say my name, the re law of reciprocity. I'm going to say, hey, my name's Luis. They're going to say their name. Um, or you can go and ask them, Hey, can I ask you a question? When you go up to somebody and you tell them, can I ask you a question? They're going to be more inclined to actually listen to what your question is because you've actually been, I don't know. I don't exactly remember why, but it's just like, you're nice enough to actually ask them like, Hey, can I ask you a question? So now that they've actually agreed to actually even listen to your question, like they realize that they've consciously agreed. They're going to be like, yes, what is your question? Right? Like you, they've now given you permission to actually ask them a question. So now they're actually going to be more willing to actually listen to the question. You know, that's how you can go up to somebody and realize that you're going to try to give them value. That's a good tip right there for you guys. Um, but also like, look at this person and say, Hey, look, I'm a human. I'm imperfect. I have to realize my psychology works pretty much just the same as anybody else's psychology. And I'm going to have my biases. I'm going to have these things 
where I'm going to halo effect or I'm going to the opposite effect. I don't know what the opposite of the halo effect is, but I'm going to look at this person and I'm going to see, hey, they have dirty clothes. Hey, they look like they might be angry. Hey, they look like this. So therefore, I already have a pre I've already judged the book by its cover. And I now think that this person is all great and flowers and sunshines. Or I now think that this person is all ugly and evil and it's just not, not it. Can't do that. You gotta appreciate people for who they are. You gotta say they're beautiful. They're absolutely so complex in their own way. They don't need to change for anything, right? Like, they don't need to change and conform to what my idea of a, what a good person should be or what how they should live their life should be or what my idea of life is or how people should live their lives. You don't have to conform to that. You know, people are like, no, like, I don't know why we tend to do that. It's the most dumbest thing that I don't know why we have. Like, why do we want to just judge things so much, man? It's so stupid. Why are you, why are you judging people? Like, you got to see them as a sunset. Like, just look. You're not going to tell a sunset, hey, man, you know, turn up the green. Hey, man, turn on the hue a little bit. I want a little bit more orange, man. Come on. No, you're going to sit there and you're going to watch and you're going to view it and from afar and be like, wow. That's crazy. And you got to look at yourself the same way, too, sometimes. When it comes to your mistakes, your imperfections, you got to look at it like that. Like, wow. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And anyways, guys, with that, I leave you. Hopefully you guys enjoyed The Laws of Human Nature. I might be watching part two soon. Maybe not. I don't know. If anybody want to uh, watch this, made it all the way through to the end. I have no idea why I make these videos too long. I talk too much. I don't actually intend to when I'm going into it. But sometimes I cannot stop myself. I see something. I get tr it triggers this response for me where I kind of just want to go in and say something because I'm just like, oh, this reminds me of this thing, the other thing that I learned and I want to share my little two cents, even though I really don't know that much. Of course, I don't I'm not somebody that thinks that just because I know a lot, I don't want to be boring. And of course, I think there is there's a level of knowledge that I should have and that I should be able to quickly be able to remember and recollect and be able to share with people, which it would be my cue to talk right i think there is a way to tell when your cue is that you're able to talk of course the more that you know the more you realize how much you don't know so the wisest people of course they're the quietest they're not going to be out here dunning kruger affecting people so they're going to be very quiet but I, that's not what i'm supposed to do here i'm i'm here to react and to you know put in my little my little piece into this otherwise people will just go and watch the regular video and then there's no need for me to be here i'm just going to be sit here i'm just sitting here my camera's not doing enough for me I got to share a little bit of me as well and a little bit of knowledge that maybe I've learned and put in my own opinions on this, right? Of course, because that's what, how our reaction should be. And that's why I talk. Um, And also with just like regular people too, when I tell them something, I'm not just going to never talk just because I realize how much I don't know. Like I realize how much I don't know. <laughs> like I honestly feel like I do. Of course, I'll, I'll know even more the more that I learn. I'll learn even more how much I don't know. I'll learn more about how much I don't know. And then I'll feel even like not dumber, but like you, I'll feel even less closer to knowing everything. The more that you understand things, you know, and you got to realize you're never going to know everything. Um, but just because you don't know everything about a thing doesn't mean that you should just completely stay quiet and never talk. That makes you a boring person. Like share what you do know. You know what I mean? Even if you can't recollect it all the way, then just say that. Say, okay, look, I can't recollect it exactly 100% because maybe I learned it a long time ago or I just kind of a little bit of it, the synapses, they just closed off. They didn't connect to the axon cells, whatever. And I forgot some things. But basically, the gist of what I learned a, f a long time ago or what I, what I previously knew is so-and-so blah 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 i tell this to you with good intentions i'm not trying to lie to you here or feed you bullshit this is just what i remember learning and that's usually how i do it right like i may not know all the details about something but that does not mean that i'm not gonna talk at all i don't think that's fair i don't think i should just shut up and not say anything just because i don't know 100 percent about a topic i never could know 100 percent about a topic it's just like what's the percentage of no like do you know do you know what percentage of a topic you should be very well versed in for you to be able to talk and not be judged for talking? Like, no, there's no percentile. Just 
know something, and then if you can recall it, share it. Right? Especially if it's going to be useful to people. I don't think you should just completely stay quiet just because you're never going to know anything about anything ever. A hundred percent. You know, that's not how that works. You should be able to talk. Otherwise, you're just boring as fuck, in my opinion. And that goes to you, Celeste, who wanted to give me a whole lesson about it, about unwanted information or like unsolicited um, opinion, right? Because I gave her my opinion on something and she's just like, oh, that's unsolicited. I didn't ask for your opinion, blah, blah, blah. Or like, I didn't ask for your, it wasn't even my opinion. It was just like my two cents. Like it, she just didn't want me to share anything at all, apparently. I don't because I didn't give her my opinion on anything. I was talking about sleep. Oh, well, I guess I did kind of say it in an opinionated way. Like I was like, oh, I think you should maybe it was like on some information about sleeping. I think maybe you should not sn hit the snooze button because when you do, you could be fucking up your productivity. You know, you're going to go back into a sleep cycle. I don't want you to hit the snooze button because you're just going to go to sleep for 10 minutes more. And a whole cycle finishes up in like. 90 to 110. I don't research that. I don't know if it's 90 to 110. I just heard it. Okay. And I think that the person who said it is trustworthy enough to not be bullshitting about that. So I think it's like somewhere around 90 to 110. That's what she knew. That's what I know now. There you go. Right. How long? Let's see it right now. Fuck it. I mean, what's stopping us? How long? My space button doesn't work. My eye button doesn't work. Ugh, sleep cycles. Sleep cycle. Length. 90 to 120. So she said 90 to 110. See, I'm not bullshitting you. Go. I'm done. Fucking Celeste. Anyways, man. I didn't know that when I said it to her. I don't. I couldn't back it up with a source. I couldn't name a source at the top of my head when I said it to her. Right? Fucking. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna call her anything. Anyway. I'm going to stop recording right there. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that, man. I'm going to see you guys in the next one. If you made it to the end, you are a fucking legend. I don't even know why you did that. I probably wouldn't do that. I'm not going to hold you. I appreciate you, though. Peace.